it's a new year, that means we've got a new batch of comic book movies. This year's gonna bring us the kickoff of MCU Phase 5. We've got a new Spider-Verse movie coming out. And after 30 plus years, Michael Keaton is returning as Batman in a Flash movie starring PR Nightmare Ezra Miller. I have a bad feeling about this. And we're getting James Gunn's final Marvel film before he takes over DC. Keep in mind, I loved the first Guardians. I really didn't like the second Guardians. So how do I feel about the third? You'll find out real soon because today I'm gonna stop and rank all 10 2023 comic book movies based off my excitement. Be sure to join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the upcoming comic book movies based off your excitement level. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list and I would love to see yours. Also, if you are in the Louisiana area, I'm gonna be at Fan Expo New Orleans this weekend, leading two different panels. One is going to be a live recording of a video for this channel. Also in the coming months, I'm gonna be in Portland, Cleveland, and Orlando. You can find out more information down below in the description and let's get started. In last place, Craven the Hunter. For me, there's just not much here to be excited about. The director's previous film was called Triple Frontier, and I did like that movie, so that gives me a little bit of hope. I want Aaron Taylor Johnson to be successful, have his own franchise, so I'm rooting for him to have a hit in this film because I like him as an actor, but I do not trust Sony and their little Spider-Man universe they're trying to build out here. The Venom movies were dumb fun. They're not like great films, but because Venom is a fun character and Tom Hardy just goes for it, they're enjoyable. Outstanding. Morbius was not good. And Craven the Hunter doesn't strike me as a character that should be the lead of his own movie. He's a B, C tier Spider-Man villain, not a movie lead. And so it just feels like executives looking at every property they have and trying to milk it for everything that it's worth. And so we're just getting another one of these Spider-Man projects. And then I look at who's writing the scripts and the screenwriters credits are like Transformers, The Last Night, Men in Black International, Uncharted. There's nothing here to get excited about. At best, they've written mediocre, big studio stuff. At best, nothing to get me excited about the project. Not impressed. And so I just don't trust Sony enough to deliver a good film when trying to adapt a B-tier Spider-Man villain into the lead of a movie. Number nine, The Marvels. This is one I don't really know what to make of it and there's not much here that I specifically get excited about because it's a sequel to Captain Marvel, it's also a sequel to Miss Marvel, and it's a spin-off of a side character from WandaVision who does have connections to Captain Marvel, but because we've seen these three lead characters in very different contexts with shows with very different tones, it's not immediately obvious what the dynamic will be like between the three of them and what that their chemistry will be on screen, in particular because Miss Marvel was aimed at such a young demographic. It is a teenage girl. I don't know what that looks like when you pair her up with a couple of ladies in their 30s. Along those same lines, I haven't really enjoyed Captain Marvel in the MCU yet. Is that like a personal attack or something? I like Miss Marvel, but I'd prefer to see Miss Marvel season two rather than this film. And then with Monica, I just don't feel like we've seen enough of her in the lead to know exactly what that will look like. You're Ralph Boner? Boner. When it comes to the director, Nia DaCosta, uh, she previously directed Candyman from a couple years back, and I wasn't particularly a big fan of that film. I thought she directed a lot of sequences really well, and it looked great, but it's just kind of too heavy-handed where the opening scene is people standing around in a circle talking about the racial implications of gentrification. So I don't know exactly how she translates it as director to the MCU. And then finally, the synopsis that we do have for this movie thus far reads as this. Following the events of Miss Marvel, Carol Danvers, Kamala Khan, and Monica Rambeau begin swapping places with each other every time they use their powers and must team up to figure out why. That plot synopsis does not sound interesting to me at all. Like a body swap movie in the MCU with characters that we haven't 
really seen interact together. I do know that Carol and Monica did interact, but that's not quite the same thing as what we're talking about in this movie. I can't get excited about that synopsis just reading it. So I kind of look at this one and the thing that keeps it out of that bottom spot is my trust in the MCU and Kevin Feige, but that trust only goes so far. Next up, Blue Beetle. This isn't a character that I've ever really followed. I have very little knowledge of Blue Beetle. My experience with Blue Beetle comes from his appearances in various Batman animated shows I've seen throughout the years. Blue Beetle at your service. Now, this was originally going to be an HBO Max original film, but then they decided to make it into a theatrical film. That feels like that's probably a good sign. I haven't seen the director's previous films, but the fact that DC recruited him for this film means that they believe him, but he was also has been hired on to direct a Transformers film. So it seems like the studios look at this guy as someone that has a lot of talent that they think they can trust with these big franchise films. However, the screenwriter's previous movie was Miss Bala, which was not a great film and is not the most encouraging sign for the script for this film. The big selling point for me is Zolo in the lead, Miguel from Cobra Kai. I'm a big Cobra Kai fan. Love the fact that he got cast in another high profile project. So I'd love it if this was a big successful hit for him because I want to see him succeed. Number seven, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Now I enjoyed the first Aquaman film. I thought it was a lot of fun and here the writer, director, and cast pretty much all returning. And for better or for worse, that means you essentially know what you're going to get with this film. I actually know two people that saw this film at a test screening back actually like eight months ago. And that's essentially what they kind of said is like, yeah, it's it's an Aquaman movie. If you liked Aquaman, you're going to get more what you liked from Aquaman. And perhaps for that reason is a little bit why it's not higher up on the list, because there's not like a thing about it yet that specifically has me excited. It's just like, yeah, more Aquaman. Okay, cool. And we don't have a trailer yet or anything like that. And right along those same lines, because this is probably the last time we're going to see Jason Momoa as Aquaman, but the movie wasn't written to close out the arc and the journey. It feels a little bit kind of like they let the air out of the balloon. It's like, yeah, I, I want to see it. I'm excited to see it, but I don't have big excitement for it because it just feels like, yeah, they got a couple more of these DC projects they need to get out before they reboot the whole universe. Then we have Shazam! Fury of the Gods, and here I'll repeat a lot of what I said about Aquaman 2. I liked the first movie. I'm down for checking out a new one. The cast and crew are all returning, so I essentially know what I'm going to get with this movie, but with everything going on with DC, since it looks like they're going to reboot this universe, since it looks like we're never going to see Shazam and Black Adam in a movie together, it's tough to get as excited about this movie in light of that context. Kind of along those same lines, they put out the first trailer for it and it was fun. It was fine. It didn't blow my mind. It didn't necessarily need to, but it was like, OK, cool. More of that franchise that I liked, but nothing specifically to like elevate it high on the level. Nothing that was like that new thing that I'm excited to check out. But I've seen all of the Fast and the Furious movies, lady. It's all about family. So I want to see it. I'll probably like it, but I don't have that. There's not that novelty of interest surrounding this one. It's just, yeah, another one of those. Number five, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. I got a lot of different feelings about this one. So I grew up watching the 1980s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon, and I was the perfect age for the 1990 movie as well as its sequel. And I watched those movies on loop all throughout the 90s, as well as the Zeros, teens, and still into the 20s. I watched them quite a bit. But now I have children that are the perfect age for a new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle film. So that's exciting for me because that is like a multi-generation feel to it. Now, I'd be more excited for it if it was live action because there's so many animated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles TV shows that I like the movies to go live action. But then I heard that they're trying to do the animation style of the Spider-Verse films that's computer animated, but in a 2D style. I went, OK, I actually get kind of excited about that. Seth Rogen producing wouldn't generically get me excited about this project. 
But what he's kind of said about what he's trying to do, being a lifelong fan, wanting to put the Teenage and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, sounded pretty good to me. Full disclosure, when I put together my first draft of this list, this was actually two slots back, but then I started doing my research on the cast, the crew, writers, directors, and I saw that the director of this was one of the co-directors and co-writers of Mitchell's vs. the Machines, and I immediately moved it up two spots ahead of Aquaman, as well as Shazam 2. Awesome! That's just how much I loved Mitchell's vs. the Machines, and that director coming in, gets me excited about this project. He also worked on the TV show Gravity Falls, which my kids have become obsessed with over the last year and even dressed up as a couple of the characters for Halloween. Number four, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. Now the previous two Ant-Man films were like post Avengers movies, opportunities for the MCU to catch its breath. They do these big gigantic Avengers movies. Then two months later, you get this small scale lightweight Ant-Man film. They were fun, but they didn't feel like they were must-watch films. They didn't feel like they were pivotal pieces to the grander scheme of the MCU. And this time, it feels like it really matters. It's kicking off phase five of the MCU. This is our first real introduction to Kang. Obviously, we have kind of a variant version of Kang introduced in Loki, but this is... Kang showing up finally as a true villain who is our big bad for this era of the MCU. Likewise, post Endgame, Ant-Man's a more high profile character and just based off the tone, feels like it has a good balance of the humor that you want from an Ant-Man film while still having a serious tone with actual stakes and consequences. Real quick before I give you my top three, be sure to join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the upcoming comic book movies based off your excitement level. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list, and I would love to see yours. Also, if you wanna look at my end of the year lists from last year, you can check those out in this playlist right up here. I mean, I did a ranking of every movie that came out last year, a best of list, worst of list, the comic book movies, horror movies, animated films, all of that fun stuff. You can check it out in this playlist right up here. In third place, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. And my top three on here gets really tricky because it's three very different movies that I'm excited about and intrigued by for three very different reasons. Now, the first Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is just a fantastic film as a Spider-Man movie, as an animated movie, and just a movie in general. It's just very cool, it's inventive, it's different, and it's highly entertaining. This time around, they're going so big and massive that they had to split it into two different movies that they wrote and put together at the exact same time. Based on everything we're seeing, it looks like they're going absolutely bonkers with the Spider-Verse concept and having tons and tons and tons of Spider-Man in this project. And based off borrowed trust from the first movie, I wanna put this one even higher up on the list because the first one is just so good. But what made the first one so good wasn't just that it's Spider-Verse, but it also that it had so much heart to it too. That it's a great Peter Parker story while being a Miles Morales movie at the exact same time. So you just have all these different arcs going on. That's what I loved about that film. And we've now gotten two different trailers for this film a year apart. And they've really only sold it on, look at all the Spider-Men, which granted does get me excited, but it's the superficial version. And so as soon as I understand what like the heart of this movie is and that, that next level, the deeper stuff, the stuff that I loved with Peter B. Parker and the way that they were helping Miles, like when I understand what that is, I'll get even more excited for this one. But, but as of right now, still top three, loved the first one, can't wait to see this one. I just hope that they still have that heart in there and it's not just, look at all the Spider-Men! Our runner up, The Flash, and this placement is based off so many different things. There's just so much intrigue surrounding this project. From the very beginning, it had a troubled pre-production. It was stuck in development hell for years. I mean, going back, Decades now, they've been trying to make a Flash film, and even this version of the film went through writers and writers and directors and directors for years. Me, baby, 
one more time. I did not think that this movie was gonna happen because they were having so much trouble agreeing on a direction to go. Then they finally locked in a script that they liked and they announced that Michael Keaton, after over 30 years, was returning as Batman. Now, Batman 89 is one of the first movies I remember going to go see in the theater. And you have to keep in mind, comic book movies back then are not like now. In 1989, he was the guy. He was the superhero because we were done with Superman movies. There were no Marvel movies coming out. And so Michael Keaton was the guy for several years. And those were my formative years of falling in love with comic book movies. Likewise, it's a multiverse story. It's got a little bit of Flashpoint thrown in the mix. All of that is awesome. And then there's Ezra Miller, the biggest PR nightmare I've ever seen for a movie. Me, baby, one more time. And then there's all the rumors of constant reshoots, a shuffling cast where they're changing out who does and doesn't appear in the movie. But all the chatter I've heard about the film from the people that have been at test screens has been really good. So my guy that goes to test screenings hasn't seen the movie, but he knows all these people that have seen it he said, everyone says it's a lot of fun. I don't know what this movie's gonna turn out to be, but it has my attention and I can't wait to find out. Is it actually awesome or is all the drama surrounding the film way more interesting than the film itself? But coming in at first place is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Like so many films on this list, it has a wild backstory. And this one has like layers to all the crazy stuff that went down. So he's hired to write and direct Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, completes the script and then gets fired by Disney over 10-year-old tweets. He's promptly hired by the competition DC to write and direct The Suicide Squad. Then he's rehired by Marvel and Disney to write and direct Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So he's working for both Marvel and DC at the exact same time. Jump Forward Suicide Squad comes out. He's completed filming and is in post-production on Guardians 3 when DC hires him to take over all of their DC films and be their new head of the studio or whatever before Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 comes out. <laughs> what a story, Mark. Now, I love the original Guardians of the Galaxy, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, for me, was one of the most disappointing films in the MCU, but not in a way that made me, like, cynical towards the franchise. And then Infinity War, Endgame, and especially the holiday special, it just reminded me of why I love these characters and love seeing them interact with interact with each other and hang out. The trailer that we got for the film makes it look like it has all the humor that you want, but it also has stakes and tragedy, big emotions, and it feels like he's really going for it to close out his trilogy of Guardians of the Galaxy films. Also, when the original movie came Came out. I took all of my interns to go see it opening night, and that was a real fond memory that I have. And so I'm hoping to try and get a bunch of them together to go see this new one when it comes out, which is kind of difficult now because they're all married and they're not all in the state of Texas anymore, but I'm hoping I can make that happen. Anyway, as for the movie itself, I can't wait to see what James Gunn is going to do and how he's going to close out our time with the Guardians of the Galaxy. So it comes in at number one. Remember, if you're in the Louisiana area, I will be at Fan Expo New Orleans this weekend doing a live recording of my most anticipated movies of 2023. You can check out my end of the year list right over there. Thank you so much for watching. Keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.